when I finally sort of bit the bullet and decided that I was going to go, um, I thought, well, there's an advantage for Nick staying here um, at Shapiro. So I want to be careful about how I broach the subject, but I also feel obliged to talk to him about it. So I went to Nick on a Friday and I said, look, no need to answer straight away, go and talk to your wife, but um, I'm thinking about starting a business. I want to know whether you want to come with me. From our Carter, this is The Bigger Picture, an inside look at the businesses that make the art world work and the stories behind the people that shape them. In August this year, Daniel Crouch Rare Books celebrated its 10th anniversary. Starting out as a Saturday boy at an antique map and print shop in Oxford at 16, Daniel and his business partner Nick would cross paths at Bonhams and go on to become the only dealers in the world specialising in atlases. While Daniel's photographic memory has helped him find the things others fail to see, it's evident that maps viewed as works of art are indeed difficult to miss. So the clue is really in the name, Daniel Crouch Rare Books. Now, more specifically, though, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the only dealer in the world that specializes in atlases. Now, while we can come back to this a little later, if this highly specialized niche isn't unusual enough, the road that I suppose led you here really begins with the job center. So you're 16 and you walk into the job center in Oxford. And what do you find? Yeah, I'm, uh, by complete fluke, I think the only person I know who's ever actually picked up a career from a job centre. Um, I, I, I walked in and there's a small handwritten note um, saying, uh, a small bookshop in Oxford, Saturday, boy required, and intriguingly, some DIY skills and advantage. Um, and I was looking for some beer money in my school holidays and went along to a shop. And, you know, I've lived in Oxford all my life and the shop I'd never, I'd never even noticed it before and I walk in the door and there's this uh, wonderful lady sadly no longer with us called Colleen and she greets me when I inquire after a job she says there's no job here and confused I'm about to turn on my heel I get called to the back of the shop by a small Italian lady called Barbara McLeod also sadly no longer with us um, and she's smoking a cigarette in a bookshop which alarmed me a little and says, ah, wait a second, wait a second. And she's on the telephone and she asked to speak to Daniel Crouch, please. And I was most confused by this. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a, a lot of confusion in ensues. And, but in the end, she turns around and says, ah, would you like a job? And I thought, oh, that was easy. Um, now, in terms of a job, it was pretty straightforward. I have a, 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 a I've actually never got up a, a job I've applied for or applied for a job I've got, which is a strange place to be. 46. Um, and it turns out there's a totally rational explanation for it, which is that um, Barbara had been at dinner with my parents next door neighbor the night before. Um, and they, she had asked if any of their kids wanted to work on a summer holiday. And uh, Colin Matthew, my parents next door neighbor said, no, but try Daniel. And she happened to be calling me at the very moment I walked into the shop. So it was a uh, a surprise to all. But now just for the un uninitiated, Sanders is not just any shop on the high street. So on your doorstep, unbeknownst to you, happens to be one of the longest running and last remaining antique map and print sellers. Now the building itself, again, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's originally an inn from the 1500s. Now some of the staff, owners, um, Ruskin and, and Morris even shopped there. Of course, notable literary figures. Did you realise what you were getting yourself in for? Um, no, not even slightly, not at all. Um, I mean, yeah, that's C.S. Lewis and Roger Luxon Green, obviously, he used to work there, I think. Um, and it was uh, a real surprise. I mean, the first thing you need to know about work at Sanders is that there really wasn't a lot of work to be done in those days. Barbara was very keen on uh, doing the crossword and drinking uh, coffee, and we did a lot of that. And then my first, my first, um, uh, my first day there, really, like any any sort of Saturday boy, I was given all the auction catalogues to sort into a date order. And while I'm doing this, uh, a great big lump of plaster falls out the wall, succeeded by a pickaxe, as Oriel College, who are the landlords, are demolishing, and this is a very Oxford moment, they're demolishing the real tennis court from the back of a shop. Um, and uh, Barbara, being a very canny businesswoman, uh, exploits this uh, lump of plaster falling out the wall onto her brand new member of staff's head and persuades the college to um, 
renovate the entire first floor of the shop and decorate that. And we, we, we then build some um, shelves there. There's a, a friend of mine called Alan Finch was working there at the time. And Barbara jokingly one day uh, decided this was going to be a map department and announced to me that I was about to be the map department manager. Little did oh she God. realize she was sealing my fate at age 16. <laughs> I mean, just on balance, if you think about this, it's it's um, it's an unusual environment to be in as a sixteen-year-old. You're surrounded by intellectuals, eccentric personalities. You've just been promoted to map manager. I mean, what impact is that having on you as a teenager, as a sixteen-year-old? I thought it was just a great deal of fun. I mean, um, Sanders was owned then by Christopher Lennox Boyd, who's a member of the Guinness family, and one of the world's great eccentrics. Um, and a member of the Guinness family. And he had a collection of some 20,000 mezzotints, um, which are a particular type of print um, that he was fascinated by. And it really was um, an entire new world opened up. And Chris was amazingly generous with, 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 with his knowledge and taught me a great deal. Um, he was also I mean, he was, he was a fantastic person to, to know. He was six foot six in three directions and didn't always take talk a lot of sense. It's, you had to decipher aristocratic English to, 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 to hear him. But he, he was uh, he was certainly um, a fount of enormous knowledge about printmaking and set me up nicely for that. But the other thing about Sanders that was lovely was it was an opportunity to learn like, from the ground up. And I always say to my colleagues, I don't really remember learning about maps and books and prints. It sort of happened to me by osmosis. And dealing in you know, really expensive 20 and 30 pound tourist prints at Sanders at one level, um, and then going right the way through, you know, maps and atlases um, and, and, and globes now, it's given me a, a really good feel for um, print processes and the, 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 the mechanism of printing and making books, which is, you know, without any intention or, or, or direction on my part has proved very useful over the years. Mm, now let's just go back to Christopher, Christopher Lennox Boyd. Um, yeah, I want you to try and um, illuminate something here. We were doing some reading and we found out that the folklore suggests that he had a rather large outstanding bill with Sanders and bought the business instead of paying his bill. What do you I, think? Um, <laughs> I am quite confident that that's true. Christopher was, Christopher was, um, Christopher was never very good at uh, managing his finances um, and used to very often sort of appear with a, a, an interesting bundle of, of, of paper that he'd bought at some auction. And, you know, I'd puzzle over why on earth he bought this, this, this folder, uh, only to discover that he'd snaffled the two things that he wanted for his own collection, which is why he bought the lot in the first place and decided that Sanders could pay for the whole thing and, uh, and, 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 and sell the dregs. I mean, it was, it was slightly chaotic, but great fun. Mm. Did you feel like you found somewhere you belonged? Yeah, I mean, I, I never imagined I, I'd stay. I always thought I'd get a real job one day. I had three leaving parties from Sanders. Um, so <laughs> I, was, I was not very good at leaving. Um, and in fact, the only, the, only thing that, the only thing that prompted me to leave, really, was just a feeling of tremendous guilt, because um, my, my wife, uh, then girlfriend, um, moved down from Scotland and became a lawyer in the city of London and was having a totally miserable time working until you know two in the morning and pulling on nighters for what was then um arthur anderson legal um and there was me rather enjoying my life swanning around this bookshop in oxford and not working more than about six or seven hours a day so i thought that, that, that um i was offered a job work to work at bonhams and i thought it'd be a very kind thing to do to for us to move to london um where we could then sort of make our life in london mm. That's a significant change, though, moving from Oxford to London. Yeah, it, well, it would have been if it had ever, ever happened. Um, I took the job in, in, in Bonhams, and about three months later, after we commuted to um, London to get on the train very romantically, uh, Jen informed me that she'd got a job in Oxford. <laughs> okay. And we've been here ever since, and I ended up being a commuter. So, okay, working at Bonhams, though, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a big leap, and it's very, very different to what you'd been doing before. How did that, how did that position come about? Well, um, Bonham's book department was in those days run by David Park, who joined there from Sotheby's. Um, and he met me at a couple of auctions where I bought some things to Sanders. And he offered me, it was a 
with hindsight, it was a very useful job. Um, and it was to really to travel around the country um, and meet every single bookseller. Um, and the idea would be that the trade would introduce us to properties and we'd take things in from people, but also to tie that in with valuations and some uh, local authority and large library um, valuations with a view to getting them in for sale at Bonhams. And um, as, a, as a training ground, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, it gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of dealers, a network that I still um, benefit from today, but also to, to, to visit some, some astonishing libraries and get a really good grounding in areas that, you know, I've, I've obviously gone to the wayside a bit since, but um, were, were, were fascinating to, to, to train with. Unfortunately, um, I didn't really enjoy the, 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 the driving um, element of it. And there's a statistic that says more than 50% of people think that they're a, a, a better than average driver. Um, I fall in the other side of things. I know I'm not very good. Um, and I you know, woke, woke up on the hard shoulder once or twice in the M1 and thought, I'm going to die if I carry on doing this. Um, and also, I, being an auctioneer, whilst handy, really didn't suit me. I didn't enjoy it and I didn't, um, I didn't feel there was a future there for me. What didn't suit you exactly? Well, as an auctioneer, um, you've got to be a bit of a tart. Um, you need to get things in as cheaply as possible and sell them as expensively as possible. Um, and you don't really get to exercise your own taste or have your own opinions. And I'm very opinionated, anyone knows me <laughs> say that. Um, and I found it a little restrictive and I'd started to uh, know what I liked. I'd have my own collection and um, I found that, that, that I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do. Mm. I think though, from uh, again, from doing some reading, it, it, it transpires that one of your first big jobs with Bonhams and with David Park involved the Birmingham Law Society. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was that was astonishing. It's actually the, pretty much the first job I did for Bob. The first job you did. Yeah. We, we, the, so David and I went up to Birmingham, and Birmingham Law Society was selling their, their their rather old library, and it was stored in the roof of the Law Society, which was a great big glass roof. And we went along to this valuation and discovered it was ten thousand volumes. Ten thousand volumes. Which is a lot. Um, and, and, and I'd imagined in my sort of naivety then that I was going to have to put a price on all these volumes. And I was like, oh my, how am I going to do this in the two days we've allocated to it? But David uh, taught me that, you know, there are various techniques you can do about averaging prices per shelf. Um, and we went a quick skip through the library, realised a lot of it was, was, was not saleable and some things were really, really interesting. I mean, there was uh, some trial reports bound in the skin of the convicted one of the more gruesome elements of it. But also, um, uh, the, 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 the collection was not very particularly catalogued. And as we're leaving, and I'm trying to think of how we're going to manage this, I asked one of the staff there if they had any, you know, list. And he says, well, not really, but I've got this disc. <clears throat> it tells you how long ago it was, they were floppy discs. And I, I got a computer disc, got home with it, and called David and said, hey, we only saw half the library. And it turns out a load of the books were stored in Birmingham University. And I don't believe that our competitors, you know, Christie's, Sotheby's, and in those days, Bloomsbury, um, had a clue that these other books existed as part of the, uh, as part of the library. So we got it. And uh, it was then my job to go and clear this 10,000 volume library, which I did using the extremely useful support of Aberdeen Shaw Porters, who are these enormous <laughs> removal guys from Aberdeen. Brilliant, brilliant job. Um, makes you realise quite how unfit and weak you are when you're working with those guys. And um, we took the whole lot down to what was the, the, then the Bonhams and Brooks had just merged. It was a Brooks car warehouse in Clapham. And Luke Batterham and I ran out these 10,000 10, books on huge shelving units out there and using the help of two porters, including one Nick Trimming, uh, with whom I, who is now my business partner, and I've worked ever since. That's interesting. I mean, that, 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 so you, you're, I mean, of course, what you've just highlighted there is, is Nick goes on to become a very significant part of your future. You both, you, you're, in, you're in business together, but your paths literally crossed as, as Nick was a head porter helping you move those the books from the Law Society. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we met at Bonhams and then um, spent a lot of time in the, in, in the pub 
after work there together. And then I went on to work for Bernard Shapiro and he asked me to start a map department. And really, although I've all, maps have been a thread through my life, it's really only then that I become uber specialized. And um, after a year of doing this and having some success, I realized that we need some assistance. And uh, I took Nick out and got him drunk and convinced him to take a pay cut. And he came and joined me. And he, he came out and he came and joined me at Shapiro where we worked together for nine years. Um, and we've been together ever since. We're actually like a, 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 an old married couple. We can order for each other in restaurants and uh, even our writing styles have become alike. <laughs> in terms of both, in terms of what you were both learning on the job though, now you're at Shapiro. Let's just go back to where things began at Sanders. How are those two different? Aside from the obvious, I mean, with respect to the, the differences in the things that you may be buying and selling, but how is that different? Because Shapiro is very much, you know, it's, uh, the name is synonymous with book dealing, map dealing at the top of the tree. How is how is that different to Sanders? Yeah, I mean, they're massively different businesses. I mean, Sanders was um, and is, it still exists today, a, you know, great retail location on Oxford High Street. And the majority of its business is done with passing trade and um, gift buying. Whereas Bernard, uh, and is, is still today, a, is an international um, level rare book dealer participating in um, all major book events around the world and all of the fairs and the art fairs. And you know, really the great experience that Bernard gave me and Nick was the introduction to books as works of art. Um, and, and, and really that, that's where we've been ever since. I think we'll come back to that point actually in a moment. I've got some notes here that I want to ask you. But I think what's also quite interesting is there was an important change that was happening in the Atlas dealing trade around this time. Just describe for us what was going on and what you could see. Yeah, not, they were all dying is the short answer. I um, mean, some of the, um, the greats, Nico Israel, Krauss, Mayalta, um, uh, and, and, and Peter de Jong, a lot of these sort of great worldwide Atlas dealers, and also to certain extent Dick Arquay, although he was still alive when I started Shapiro, um, they just, they, 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 they'd all dropped off um, and many had died and there was this opening in the market and that happened really at the same time that, that a lot of the material that had fed the market um, after the Berlin Wall came down had dried up and previous to that a lot of the map and atlas trade had been based around book breaking so people would take a book commit biblioside and remove the map from it. Aside. <laughs> remove the map from it and sell those as decorative pictures. And the, 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 the change happened was as the supply started to dry up, because in the 70s and 80s, people just didn't imagine you'd run out of atlases to cut up. But by the 90s and early 2000s, um, the whole atlas had become worth more than the sum of its parts. And in fact, really, ever since I started at Shapiro, it's more likely that dealers will try and find a missing map to complete an atlas than they will do to take a razor blade to it to sell it as sheep, which is obviously a good thing for the number of atlases remaining in the world. Um, and so we were in a position where there weren't so many dealers and there was this, you know, scarcity of good atlases on the market that we were able to then work our way into be the suppliers of. Um, and that coincided with, you know, presenting maps and atlases at art fairs as something that people hadn't necessarily considered as, as, as three-dimensional objects of art rather than collectibles. I, I, I like to draw a distinction between maps as collectibles and maps as fine art. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a very healthy market with a natural home on the internet for the inexpensive material. Um, uh, I'm a collector myself at all levels um, in, in one respect, but there's also a market for maps as fine art um, where the maps and atlases are much, have, have much more in common with a painting or a sculpture, for mm. example. But the, the, this, this, this particular moment in time as, as the, the, the atlas trade is beginning to change, change hands, I, I suppose, was this the lightning strike for you that, that you could see happening and you thought this might be something that I can, I can be a part of, I can rejuvenate this. It, was that was what was going on in your mind at that time? I think if I had the wit or vision 
to do that, and I could say that. I think the truth is it probably happened more by accident. Um, but certainly, I mean, you know, I, I, I find that maps and apps is fascinating. And I also think there are some uh, cultural changes that happened really um, with the advent of the internet that made a big difference to um, how maps and apps are perceived. Uh, if you think about it, we, you know, the world is much more globalised, we travel more and we emigrate more and we see more, but also on a sort of lower level, your engagement with maps or one's engagement with maps is, is so much more now than it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, when you go and book a restaurant, you see a map that shows you where the restaurant is. When you get a taxi, you watch the taxi arrive on a map um, on your phone. And when you look at the news, data visualization um, for the stories in the news are off, is often expressed geographically. We see many, many more maps than we used to. I think people will, therefore got a greater affinity for cartography than that traditionally they have had. Um, and that means that that combined with sort of decorative tastes where people like uh, contemporary art, but also much more graphic arts and maps are very, you know, quite starkly graphic means that people, you know, it's the easiest thing in the world is to sell a map of, uh, to someone who they've got their house on it. Um, and so I think that, that fashion changed and maps became much more interesting. Mm. But the breakaway uh, obviously has, you know, did, it did occur that you eventually left uh, Shapiro and you partnered up with Nick. Tell us about that moment in time and how did that occur? Well, um, it was, again, without much direction, really. It was sort of suggested to me rather than um, a, a decision I particularly made. So there was a great collector of sea atlases um, called David Gestetner. Um, and the Gestetner family play a very large part in this part of my life. Um, and he invited me to give evaluation on his collection. And I went there, I went with Bernard. Um, and David just took me aside and quietly said, I, you know, I didn't mean for you to sell this to Bernard. You know, this is for you, you should sell this. Um, and at the same time, I was talking to uh, another customer about things and he suggested that it was time that I started my own business. Um, and in fact, he actually ended up um, partially offering to help me do it. And then 2008 happened um, and the worldwide economic collapse. But also uh, David Gestetner was one of the last guys out of the hotel in the Mumbai bombings. Um, and phoned me up shortly afterwards to say, Daniel, you know, I, I've, I've changed my mind. I had a near brush with death. I don't want to sell my collection just yet. Um, and on the same day, I got a phone call from this American customer of mine who suggested that, you know, he might want to partner with me going into business and said, Daniel, you know, the world's not looking like this is a, also pretty much a day Lehman collapse, I think. Um, the world economy is not looking good. Now is not the time to start a business. And so 2009 was a bit of a sort of fallow year for a lot of people. Um, and then sadly, during 2009, uh, David Gostetner died. Um, and his collection ended up in Sotheby's. But David's brother, who's a bookseller, Jonathan Gostetner, um, spoke to the, the, the David's children and said, well, actually, you might want to talk to Daniel about this. I know that David was. And we ended up doing a deal whereby the Gostetner collection, one year later than the original visit, or perhaps more than a year, um, ended up being Nick and my catalogue number one. Wow, so that became your first exhibition. Yeah, it wasn't a bad way to start. <laughs> but what a thing to have gone through. I mean, that, that must have been enormously uh, difficult in a trying time when you're trying to get a business off the ground that uh, essentially a number a number of your backers pull out because of this because of the situation yeah i mean thank goodness we didn't um and how you did know, you hold your metal at that time if it's not a, if it's not a silly question i didn't really have a choice we just you know we were at shapiro we were employed it was a, a, you know it wasn't a very unpleasant place to be it was very enjoyable but yeah obviously there was that that yeah and and, and I mean, I'm, I, Nick's involvement here is, is, is not small. Um, when I finally sort of bit the bullet and decided that I was going to go, um, I thought, well, there's an advantage for Nick staying here um, at Shapiro. So I want to be careful about how I broach this subject, but I also feel obliged to talk to him about it. So I went to Nick on a Friday and I said, look, you know, 
no need to answer straight away, go and talk to your wife. But um, I'm thinking about starting a business. I want to know whether you want to come with me. And that was your pitch? Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> Nick went, well, of course I am. And, you know, <laughs> I've known that to on the cards for ages. <laughs> we never had the so conversation. You'd so already know, but you'd never spoken about much it. Much smarter than me. Um, mm. And yes, yeah, so that, that 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 was that. And you know, we we, we left on um, on relatively good terms with Bernard. And you know, he, he all credit to Bernard. He he saw that it was inevitable. And we've had a decent working relationship ever since. He's a he's a fantastic bookseller. Mm, that's fantastic. Let's just go back though, if we may, just to the of course the, the first exhibition. Um, where did that take place? Um, well, we were very fortunate in the um, guy and Harry Actor very kindly uh, allowed us to use their showroom on Fulham Road. Uh, well, that's about Broward. as good as it gets. Yeah, so that was, a, that was a, quite a nice start. And Nick and I worked out of a um, uh, attic above a bookseller, Temple Bookbinders, who very kindly gave us a, a, a rent-free year to start our business. And then we took the shop um, in Berry Street in 2011, where we've been ever since. Um, and actually, there's a, there's a nice little c- circle here, which is um, Ian Barnes, who owns Temple Bookbinders. Uh, when he left Maltby's bookbinding in Oxford to start his career on his own, um, he walked into Sanders of Oxford and I gave him his first job, which was to make 40 folders for the shop. And, and he, he had no way of making them. Fortunately, it was a warm summer. He had nowhere big enough to store all these things, but thought he couldn't turn the job down. Um, and it was only, yeah, some t- 10 years later, that, uh, 12 years later, that he reminded me of this when Nick and I were looking for somewhere and said, you know, you helped me start my business. Is it only fair I, I help you start yours? <laughs> Cyclical. Now, one of the things that, that, that uh, we did touch on this before, but I find it very interesting that you've not actually got a formal education. There's no art history degrees, just on the job, hands on experience. But I think one of the things that we do need to talk about is your memory, because it's quite unusual. Can you tell us about your memory? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I remember images of things. Um, it's actually, um, uh, I, I will always remember a map that I've never seen before. And, uh, What's this called? Describe it. The, 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 I mean, the, the sort of posh word is an eidetic memory. Uh, it, it, means, it means that there are certain, I mean, I'm totally hopeless at learning languages, um, but I'll never forget a map I've seen. And I can skip through folders of, of maps and see very small differences in them. And it does, it does make dealing quite a lot easier. Um, and I'm always looking for things we, we haven't seen before. There's a um, Jesuit, a 16th century Jesuit called Matteo Ricci, who also a map maker, um, and he has this um, discussion about a memory palace. I think Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle picked it up for Sherlock Holmes as well, which is the idea that you have a visual memory where you can build um, blocks of memory chunks by visualizing where things are as a, as, a, as a picture. And my brain kind of works a bit like that with with, with maps, and I can. You know, I can I can see corners of maps and that have got a change from the last one I saw, and somehow it sticks there. So that's a commercial a commercial edge, really, in 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 your job, I would imagine. Yeah, it certainly helps. <laughs> I mean, now, perhaps so. Go on, sorry. I mean, what, 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 what sort of fascinates me um, about maps is, um, you know, obviously they are graphic and they they, they, they tell stories. And it's the stories of the map, and I think the elements of the um, story map. So, for example, to Matteo Ricci, you know, his his maps um, are the first Eastern and Western uh, combined cartographies, and his own tale as a, a, a guy Jesuit who left Italy on a journey to China and became the first Westerner set foot in China. Yeah. That sort of story is what's really compelling about maps. The visual element is secondary to that. Hmm. I think that. I mean, we're gonna. I'd like to touch on more on on the map specifically in a moment. But you have um, a, a dare I say, a reductionist way of describing your business. Yeah. Everything uh, that you and your team do today. What is it? Yeah, we, we, it? it's it's very neatly defined, uh, uh, which is that everything we sell um, is an answer to one of two questions: either where am I, or what time is it? And you know, for those of us philosophical bent, uh, obviously the two are interconnected um, because time and space are 
uh, very closely related and our time is only uh, a, a reflection really of, of where the, the, the earth sits uh, in, in, in the universe at any given time. And so we sell maps and celestial charts and sundials and scientific instruments and uh, voyages and travels. And uh, when Nick and I started the business, it was just the maps and atlases. Um, and we've been rather careful at sticking to what we know and what we like. Um, and also it means the business is a sort of size that works. We never find there's too much material on the market for us to buy. And we've sort of not quite run out of money yet. So um, it's obviously working okay. Um, and in answering those questions, we've then expanded it a little bit to include, yeah, scientific instruments and globes, which has become, yeah, uh, a new a new side to the business. So where am I and what time is it? I mean, it's evident that, you know, as, as an outsider looking in, that, that what you're doing yourself and Nick and your team is, you are asking us, as you've already said, to consider maps as, as pieces of, of art. But I think let's just talk about maps as functional things because to the uninitiated, they are incredibly interesting things to look at. And moreover, I'd really like to hear from you more about what you refer to as cartographers. So these were the individuals that would actually create maps. I do not understand how on earth something like that, how one would approach creating a map. Less so, let's take, for example, it's 1770. Manhattan is 25,000 people, mostly farmland. The governor of New York, a chap called Henry Moore, com commissions um, Bernard Ratzer to survey the land. So what I'd really like to, you to help us understand it, how on earth do they do this with such accuracy? Well, yeah, you mentioned the word map makers, and it's a, a, it's a real portmanteau word because we use uh, map maker to describe variously the artist, the surveyor, the engraver, sometimes even the publisher. Um, and the name of the map maker that becomes associated with a particular map often depends on which one of those agents, and you may have several people filling all those roles, is the prime mover and the, 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 the main name associated with it. So you mentioned uh, Bernard Ratzer, he's actually a surveyor. Um, and with, especially at that period in time in the 18th century, you started to get uh, huge advances in technology. So you've got much more accurate levels and um, uh, chains to, to measure distance and sextants and uh, trigonometrical uh, assisted, uh, assisting equipment. And so you've got the military surveyors have been busy throughout the, the, that second half of the 18th century, honing their skills while France and the British Isles are surveyed trigonometrically and, and measured according to you know standardised principles for the first time, culminating at some years later in 1815 with the, with, with the Ordnance Survey. And it's no accident that it's called the Ordnance Survey. That's because it was the military, it was the gunners who ended up correcting and, 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 and um, editing the first accurate maps of the British Isles. And a lot of that work was done, as you say, in, 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 in the military. And so during the American War of Independence, you've got um, these surveyors who are working on the military side of things and, and, and using those techniques to accurately map places like Manhattan. And how accurate were these maps at the time? Are they, do they still hold up today? I mean, given that, that, you know, through history, times have changed, you know, what was once farmland is now skyscrapers, but how accurate were they? Oh, they, 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 they are remarkably accurate for them. I mean, uh, some of the big advances just after this period, really, um, make maps much more accurate because they start to work on things like paper shrinkage and uh, making scale bars more consistent. But the surveying techniques in the 18th century, I mean, they're pretty good. Uh, you look at the Ratson map of Manhattan, uh, I mean, there are some uh, bonkers things on there. You realise Murray Hill really was quite a substantial hill. Um, and Wall Street looks like it's halfway up Manhattan rather than tucked in right at the bottom. Wall Street's uh, displayed on the map. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wall Street, one of the earliest uh, streets in, in, in Manhattan. Um, and then you can you know, see, see lots of the landowners after they take their name now. So it's, it's, it's a great map. But yeah, it's pretty accurate. 
Um, how would how would someone have made a, made that term career choice to be to become a surveyor or indeed a, a cartographer? I know you've exp, you've explained in broad brushstrokes the lots of different individuals that were involved in the production of something like a, a, th these maps. But how would someone have, have have specialized and found themselves in that position? What backgrounds were they from? It seems so such an unusual uh, profession, such an unusual career. Yeah, I mean, the, the, a lot of it was um, passed on through families. Um, and it's all apprenticed work. So it's not really, a, I mean, except in the military uh, engineers who obviously were, were trained by the military, but a lot of the commercial map producers. Uh, and again, you've got to separate out the surveyors who would have been taken on as apprentices as a sort of you know, relatively middle class job. Um, and then separate that out from the printers and publishers, which is a separate trade, really. And again, that catch-all term, map maker, is often used to apply to both of those. Uh, we did some interesting work uh, as a sort of company on doing a family tree of globe publishers during the 18th century, um, and realizing that you know apprentices and um, uh, sons, daughters, widows, um, and they all actually link in, and there's. 18th century fashion for pocket globes, if you like Google Maps for the uh, 18th century, a globe the size of a cricket ball. Um, and this was sort of a gentleman to carry in his pocket to settle an after dinner argument or pop on the library shelf. And we realized. What kind of that, arguments that, were people having? What kind of arguments were people having where, where a pocket globe was, was providing the well, answers? I, well, I, I could imagine if you're in the you know, East India Company and you've got your stocks and shares and you're concerned you've got a missing ship or you're worried about where your, your, your next uh, opium uh, boat is going to be or is, is going to get to you, you, you pull out your pocket globe and you can discuss it with the person sitting next to you in Jonathan's Coffee House in London. <laughs> um, but uh, the, 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 the fashion for these things, you, there are all sorts of pocket globes. We've, we've had sort of 30 or 40 different types of these things. And you suddenly realise that the people who made them over a period of you know, 140, 150 plus years, they were all interconnected and related to each other in one way or another. And it's really quite a small world. As a social document, what do maps tell us about civilization? I realise that's quite an all-encompassing question because they were different things at different times. But just help us understand what do they tell us about civilization and our, and our understanding of the world around us, both at the time and looking at it from our perspective now. Well, we're all defined by geography. Um, one of my favourite images, and in fact I bought it recently, um, is not a map; it's a photograph. Uh, it's Earth rides, um, and it's taken from the Apollo Eight mission, and it's as you know the the the, the, the Earth is lit up by the sun from the from and you're viewing it from the moon and so i can't remember who told me once and it didn't occur to me but you know there have only ever been a hundred million human beings um and all bar three of them are visible um a hundred billion i should say um 100, all bar three of them are visible in that photograph somewhere whether they're buried or cremated or alive and that's a really arresting idea about how um our geography defines us as a, a, a species. And then on a much smaller level, um, you think about, you know, I'm sitting here in the Vale of White Horse in Oxford. Um, the Vale of White Horse is called that because, you know, some few thousand years ago, people bred horses here, white horses. And so much so they decided to carve one of them onto the side of a hill at the, on the ridgeway. Um, and that defines the town, the, the, the village I live in, Hinksy, which is Hengster. White horse, and that part of what defines us all and who we are. Um, and I suppose that's what the maps, um, on, on a very grand level, that's what helped maps determine and, and geography determine civilization. And maps are our own way of expressing that. Mm. Well, maps are, um, would it be fair to say they were used as a, a symbol of status, do you think? Oh, very much so. Um, you can define the concept of nation state by cartography and you know the concept of a, uh, a country exists hand in hand with maps I and mean, the nation state was born in the uh, sort of 16th century the idea was and that's pretty much when cartography takes up as well and if you were a, a, a ruler of one of these nation states or even a city state um, you, you know your knowledge and geography of geography of the world is defined by your ability to mark it out um, and, and, and display it. 
very famously, um, a French king uh, said that Cassini, who'd mapped um, France for the first time, had cost him by more land than all of his enemies by moving the uh, coastline with proper measurement in and cost him sort of a third of the size of France as a result of it. Wow. I mean, you, we could we could we could devote an, an you know much more time to this, but I think one of the things that I'd like to kind of to to, to end on is just to is just to think more about the journey that you've been on in particular yourself and Nick, um, and it's it's curious because August this year actually marks ten years since you both ventured into the unknown, and even on your Instagram, there's a picture, and I think a lot of people who've built businesses. Will be able to relate to it and it's the picture of yourself and nick in a loft there's a printer and a couple of computers when you look at that photo now 10 years and the one percent inspiration and the 99 percent perspiration that's gone into that what goes through your mind yeah i mean it doesn't seem like very long ago actually um i don't think there was even a printer i think it was we actually had our, our first uh, our first uh, day in the office I propped up two bits of glass on some auction catalogues, and that was our desk until we popped a habitat. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, yeah, it's been it's been great fun, um, and it really is the best job in the world. We get to do our own hobby for a job. One day, someone might wake me up, and make me go and do something serious instead. Um, but it's very good fun. If you could go back um, to the guys you were then, what would you say? I'd say in about six years' time, take some time off and go campaign to remain in the eu i know it seems really unlikely <laughs> that people are going to actually vote to leave it but they will mm. and what advice would you give someone who's starting out in, in in dealing in maps or books oh that's an easy one get a decent accountant um uh, it's, it's it's what about a photographic memory that that that, that helps but that the helps. health is far more important i mean it, cash flow is king um one of the mistakes i made at sandals many um, but the one that, that really is, is I tried to do my own bookkeeping and my own accountancy. And it was pure misery. I wasn't very good at it. Um, and I really, really learned to resent it. And for the simple expedience of getting a decent bookkeeper and a decent accountant, that element of the business is taken away from me. But, you know, in all seriousness, cash flow is king. Um, and you've got to make sure that there's always enough money to go and buy that really good thing. And Nick and I have a bit, bit of a motto that we don't stick to very well, but don't buy it because it's cheap. Um, and you make a big mistake when you buy things that look like a, 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 they're inexpensive and they're rubbish. And actually, it's much better to buy things that you should never apologise for. Um, and the best of the best. And yeah, if it's a watch worth, it's, it's always buy, always buy the, the, the most interesting and the best things on the market. Now, on the subject of buying, let's let's end with this question. What advice would you give to someone who's thinking about purchasing a map for the first time or, or, or a book of this kind or an atlas? Um, buy something you like. And again, don't buy it because it's just because it's cheap. You know, um, try and find something that means something to you and is in very good condition, original colour. I mean, I, I bang on about this a bit too much probably, but there's a lot of modern coloured maps out there and... I very firmly believe that in years to come, they will be looked like, will looked upon as objects that have been tarnished somewhat. Um, and, you know, by, by original object in original condition, by something with a story. Um, and uh, collectors are, are, are born and not made, but what you collect is, is really important. And I watch a lot of people, um, embark upon collections that um, they then revise and change. And it's quite a good idea to have a sort of a, a set plan for direction you're going to go in and research it thoroughly and you know, befriend dealers. We, we, we love talking about maps and books. Um, and contrary to you know, what a lot of you might think, we're not all avaricious beasts who are after a quick buck. We actually quite like working with people over many years and building relations. Let's just talk, actually, and you've just, it, spring, it springs to mind. Tell us about the people that buy maps and, and, and books now. How do, you, how do your paths cross and do you describe uh, the, the map collector, the book collector to us? Well, the, the, we've done some work on this, actually, and the, the, rather depressingly, the single most uh, defining characteristic of our customers is that they're male. 
um, which is, I, I've heard people say that maps are very male things. I, I don't agree with that at all. Um, but it is true that almost all of our collectors are, 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 are men. However, for many years, both the second and sort of fourth best, biggest clients of ours have, have been ladies, but they are definitely in the minority. Um, I think maps appeal to people who um, are interested in global affairs and the world and travel. Um, and when I look at the, 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 the career backgrounds of most of our collectors, I mean, obviously you don't, you don't, you don't buy rather expensive works of art until you reach a certain point in your life. You know, you, you probably have to have your kids educated, the house done, and at least one car before you start thinking about a map collection. Um, much, much, much to my annoyance. It's not how I live my life. I buy maps first and worry about everything else afterwards. But, um, uh, but the, 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 the background for most of our customers is there's a lot of people in uh, the financial industries and also self-starters and people in the tech world. So people who get the technology behind maps and people who get the globalization, globalization's influences on cartography. Do you think map collectors are connected by the by a, a similar feeling that they get when they stare at that map? Do you think it's all reminding us about the our place within the world? I know that sounds very tweet, but do you think there's there's a there's a theme that connects map co collectors in that way? Yeah, and I also think the combination of art and science. I think people get really attracted by that that you can have the two um, bound up together. Um, I think cartography has traditionally been relegated down the arts. Um, but it is worth remembering that um, you know, Albrecht Dürer was a map maker, Hans Holbein was a map maker, um, Rembrandt's pupil Lupanius was a, was, a, was a map maker. So you know, there are plenty of, there's, there's plenty of art in cartography. Equally, there's lots of science. Um, you know, Galileo drew maps of the moon, um, and you'll find many scientists, of the, the whole story of longitude um, and Harrison and his clock is deeply bound up with cartography. And so it's that combination that I think people find really attractive and the stories that go along with the development of not just the age of discovery and exploration on Earth, but also the scientific endeavours that went hand in hand with that. Um, and, 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 and the politics of it as well. It's interesting, the intersection between art and science. Do you th that's certainly the way it feels today. And I feel that one of the, the beauties of, of, of yourself and Nick and the team that you're working with, that's you're helping us see maps, uh, uh, that intersection, art and science. Do you think that that's originally how they were, were, were considered or they were purely used for, for scientific reasons? Oh, absolutely. The maps were, some of the earliest maps were definitely used um, uh, uh, or seen as works of art. Um, really? Well, if you walk along the um, map corridor in the Vatican, um, I can't think of a better example than that, actually. You've got views of all the different states, papal states in, in, in Italy um, as war frescoes. Um, and that's, you know, definitely art and science combined in the church there. Mm. That's so interesting. Daniel Crouch, thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you for listening. You can follow and subscribe to The Bigger Picture wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about this episode or to reach out to us directly, please visit arcata.com.